I appreciate the invitation to come and speak today. And I've been appreciating the diversity of scientific knowledge here. So I'm going to change our topic from the ice sheets to the ionosphere. And since I get to go first in this session, I'll try to give you a little bit of an introduction as to what the ionosphere is and what kind of perturbations to the ionosphere we're looking at and how we can do that with GPS data. <clears throat> so if I were a um, person studying the um, ice sheets, I would look at this title and I'd come up with a couple questions. What is the ionosphere, for one? How do thunderstorms play into perturbing the ionosphere? And how can we use GPS measurements to um, understand anything about this? In particular, we use something called TEC, or total electron content. So I will discuss those things. So what is the ionosphere? The ionosphere is a region of the atmosphere that is um, ionized and made into a plasma by the incoming solar radiation. And this here is a little schematic of altitude um, in the daytime and the nighttime, since the daytime and nighttime ionosphere vary. Um, because in the nighttime, this solar radiation turns off, and um, the atmospheric constituents relax to certain levels. So when the in incoming, ionos incoming solar radiation um, impacts the atmosphere, it creates different levels of ionization, and we call them, we layer them, and we call them the D, E, and F layer, going from lower to higher altitudes. And the main region I'll be talking about in this talk is the F layer, which is the region with the most, uh, the highest concentration of electron density. And um, I will also briefly touch on the D region, which is the bottom side of the ionosphere, where signals, um, radio frequency signals that you're are bouncing from one location on the ground to another would bounce off of like um, radio signals. Um, so mostly in the um, in the past, scientific works have studied how solar radiation impacts the variability in the ionosphere. So solar storms and geomagnetic activity, and on a large scale, the, this is a ma major factor in impacting the ionosphere. Um, and I think you will hear a bit about this in Sivani's talk later. Um, I'm not going to focus on this particular aspect of the variation. Instead, what I'll talk about is um, something people have started looking into probably in the past 10 years or so, which is the impact of events below the ionosphere, um, specifically in the troposphere, like thunderstorms, or earthquakes and tsunamis on the, at the lower levels, and how those can impact the ionosphere. Um, now, this talk in particular focuses on thunderstorms, and how, how can thunderstorms affect the ionosphere. And, and on one side, you have electrical effects, which are quite interesting, but I'm not going to focus on them a lot. But the electric fields from thunderstorms can are proposed to be able to seed instabilities in um, the existing, when there's an ex existing instability in the plasma above the um, electric fields imposed by the thunderstorm and the electromagnetic pulses from lightning itself are proposed to be able to um, create instabilities and depletions in the electron density. And um, in, there's another um, class of events which are electrical phenomena themselves above thunderstorms, which kind of connect into the ionosphere, called elves, sprites, and blue jets. And um, these areas of research kind of got me into the um, GPS world studying the ionosphere. But I'm going to focus more on the, the neutral effects from thunderstorms and how they impact the ionosphere in this talk. So in particular, those neutral effects are um, atmospheric gravity waves. Now, these are not gravitational waves. These are buoyancy waves um, that are caused when the, the thunderstorm sort of oscillates in height around the tropopause. They, it can produce these waves as it, um, at its, as it oscillates, and they can travel up into the ionosphere and perturb the electron density. 
And it's, that, it's the perturbation electron density that we can measure with the GPS signal that I'll discuss. Also, there are acoustic waves, which are thought to be, originate from convective activity in thunderstorms. These are compressional waves, and they also propagate to the ionosphere and perturb it. Um, they have a different frequency, so we can start to separate out the acoustic waves from gravity waves. Um, now, when these waves interact with the plasma in the, um, in the F region, the main ionospheric region, they are hypothesized, hypothesized to be able to seed um, instabilities and create these bubbles. So it's unclear whether the waves or the electrical effects are the primary seed of this effect. But what happens is that when you're measuring it with an ionosond, trying to measure the ionospheric profile, you get this profile that spreads out the um, return signal. It's called spread F. Um, so that's uh, one result of the effect of thunderstorms on the ionosphere. And we're trying to understand the mechanisms, the interaction mechanisms there. Let's see. So I have a few examples of um, what people have seen in terms of effects of ionosphere on the ionosphere from thunderstorms. And so these two figures are um, effects on the D region, which is the bottom side ionosphere. And in both of these cases, we have signals that are bouncing off the lower ionosphere, and we're interpreting the, we're getting the received signal to understand what was happening with the lower ionosphere. On the um, left-hand side, there is a um, figure from a paper from Marshall and Snively in 2014, where they used a narrowband transmitter near a thunderstorm to bounce off the ionosphere, and they saw these really nice two-minute, two to four-minute waves, which are indicative of acoustic waves affecting that region. And then um, I had a, had a paper in about 2011 where we developed a technique to use lightning signals as a broadband transmitter to bounce off the ionosphere. And we were able to look in time and distance. You can see on the right-hand side these slanted wave fronts that indicate um, gravity waves moving away from a thunderstorm. And the period and speed of these is cons consistent with the gravity waves. Now, if we move up to the F region where there's a higher electron density, a lot of work has been done here which, uh, with a technique that I, I will be discussing. And uh, a similar technique will be used um, that Giorgio, I believe, will discuss with tsunamis. What you can do is look at perturbations in the ionospheric electron density, which is shown in the middle plot here. This is a, a picture from the paper of Nishioka in 2013, where they looked at ionospheric variations near um, from a F5 tornadic supercell in Moore, Oklahoma. This was the 2013 event, I believe. And they could see concentric gravity waves moving away from the supercell and they could also see long-lasting acoustic waves with um, periods of about four minutes to the south of the supercell. Um, so again, in the middle one here, you can see this time versus distance plot. The slanted wave fronts show you how the, the speed of the waves moving away from the region. So these are examples of uh, effects of thunderstorms on the ionosphere. And most of the time, these are case studies of particular events. But what I've been working on is trying to understand, beyond case studies, if we can quantify the ionospheric response based on thunderstorm size or characteristics. So I've looked more into um, statistical studies over long periods of time in certain regions. And so the two studies I have here are one in the US Great Plains and one in the Argentine-Brazilian Plains, which um, these two regions were chosen because they both have similar thunderstorm types, which is that called uh, mesosphere, mesosphere convective systems. So these are the very large storms that you can get um, on the Great Plains. Um, and I chose these two regions because they have this area with, with similar storm types, but they're in different ionospheric regions. There's the mid-latitude regions and the low-latitude regions. And the ionosphere behaves very differently in these regions due to the orientation of the magnetic field and how it interacts with 
the plasma. So I'm going to go into first the technique that we are using to measure ionospheric perturbations. Um, since this might not be the way you typically look at GPS data. So we use um, the two frequencies, the L L1 and L2 frequencies transmitted from the GPS satellites. Um, and with the receiver on the ground, measure the phase delay and the group delay that is imposed on the signal due to the plasma itself. And because they're different frequencies, the, the two frequencies respond differently to the plasma and get delayed differently. Um, so if you account for this delay, you can determine the integrated electron density along the line of sight from the receiver to the satellite. Um, and this is, gives you a measurement in terms of electrons per, per square meter. And we use a unit that makes it a little bit easier to talk about, which is called the TEC unit, uh, TECU, which is 1 times 10 to the 16th electrons per, per square meter. So this is um, a, a typical order of magnitude that you would get along that line of sight from receiver to satellite. Now, it's often easier to think about a vertical um, total electron content, or tech. And so we map the slant total electron content from on the ray to a vertical line of sight that intersects with the line of sight from between the receiver and satellite at an, a region of peak electron density. Typically, that's about 350 kilometers. So that allows us to give our measurement a location in space. Now, when the satellite moves over a ground receiver, you're going to get um, a region that's probed that moves over a period of hours. So here is an example of some of the data that we get using this method. So the, um, the x-axis here is, is hours. And then the top panel shows the vertical tech. So this is the, that mapped um, slant tech onto the vertical and how it varies over a period of hours. Now, most of the variation is just based on um, changing conditions, changing solar conditions and changing positional conditions uh, with the satellite. So we want to remove the long-term trend to get these smaller variations in the ionosphere due to whatever you're looking for. Like, I'm looking for variations due to thunderstorms. Um, so that second panel shows what happens when we remove the long-term trend, and we see this residual variation. And what I've done at this point is to break this signal into different regimes. So I filter the data to an acoustic wave regime of 2 to 4 minutes and a gravity wave regime of 6 to 16 minutes to look at um, how, how the thunderstorms affect signals in these re regime, regimes. And then what I wanted to do was look at when the signal surpassed a certain threshold. So I look at the amplitude of the signal, and I sort of mark where the signal surpasses the, the threshold of interest. Um, and so the red marks on the third panel show where that particular filtered signal in the acoustic wave band surpasses the threshold that I've imposed, meaning that there is significant activity in that band. And then, um, so this is a one receiver, one satellite signal over a period of hours. But using many, you can use many receivers, um, existing receivers, and look at the signals to all the different GPS satellites. And for, for this, I did a case study in that red box shown up there. And I used all the receivers that are the diamonds. And some of the diamonds are outside the box. But even so, their data sometimes, um, the ionospheric line of sight sometimes crosses the, into the regime of interest. So I'm still using those sensors when they have data in that regime. And then what you can do is look at all the receivers in that box and all the GPS satellites. And you get these arcs across the landscape. And the arcs are in light gray there, every single arc that's um, in my area of interest. And then when my signal surpassed a certain threshold, I marked it in red. And so the left-hand side shows the acoustic wave signal, and the right-hand side shows the gravity wave signal. And the darker contours underneath show lightning activity contours. 
Um, so the top two panels are the are a large thunderstorm, so they have the same lightning activity, but one's just acoustic wave activity above and one's gravity wave. And then the lower one is more of a medium-sized thunderstorm. So what you can see doing this is that um, you definitely can see more acoustic wave and gravity wave activity with the larger thunderstorm than the medium thunderstorm. But I wanted to look at quantifying this effect over many storms. So um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but I developed a way to grid up the space and to figure out what, what area of the area of, of the region of interest was being perturbed in these different frequency regimes. And um, since the arcs don't cover every single spot on the, on the region of interest all the time, I basically accounted for that by determining how much of the region of interest was being probed by the arcs at any given time, and then um, accounting for the fact that we weren't detecting the whole region. And so after doing that, I, would come up, I came up with an area covered um, by large acoustic wave perturbations and an area covered by large gravity wave per perturbations, and I could comp compare that to the area of thunderstorm activity. So in this particular plot, it shows one month of data from the US Great Plains, and this particular month is May, um, but I did this for all the months that I was looking at. And the horizontal axis is days in this case, and then the storm area or ionospheric affected area is on the vertical axis. The black one shows thunderstorm activity, and the upper red one shows gravity wave activity, and the lower red one shows acoustic wave activity. And so, in general, you can see that thunderstorm activity has a diurnal pattern, which is expected for thunderstorms due to the heating, solar heating and um, cooling over land masses. So this particular type of plot wasn't that useful to me because it's hard to tell the correlations here. So what I did was I took all this, these days, um, May through July, for this particular case study, and I averaged them diurnally. So now we have one day's worth of time along the x-axis in um, hours. And I separated the data between high thunderstorm activity days and low thunderstorm activity days. So the top panel shows the thunderstorm activity and how much area was covered by thunderstorm activity versus over, the, over the course of the day on, a, on average. And then the second one is how much area was covered by gravity wave activity. And the third one is acoustic wave activity. Um, now, the separation into the high thunderstorm activity days and the low thunderstorm activity days is the blue versus the red. And the thunderstorm plot, I multiplied the red curve by 10. So you could see that the, the diurnal pattern is the same, even though there's a lot less um, thunderstorm activity. So basically, you don't get a day without lightning in this region in the summer. Um, so when we look at the gravity wave and the acoustic wave plots, we definitely see that, that there is a, um, an increase in gravity wave and acoustic wave activity corresponding to the thunderstorm activity. But even on the days with little thunderstorm activity, we do have a gravity wave peak um, in a similar region. However, the acoustic wave activity does seem to die down. So with this, we're, this is one of the first um, measurements to try to quantify what, how large of a, an affected area in the ionosphere will you have if you have thunderstorm activity of a certain magnitude. So that was the um, mid-latitude study, which is a little bit simpler because the ionosphere is pretty simple, relatively simple in the Mid, in the mid-latitudes. So then I came to the question of lower latitudes, which has a lot more complicated electrodynamics due to the magnetic field orientation. So the question here is, is the same effect appear, apparent in the equatorial storms, or do other um, processes dominate? So I chose a region that had similar storm types, as I mentioned before, but I had to use a larger region because the density of GPS stations that I had available was um, lower for the uh, South American region. And what I found here is that when you look at a particular arc, one receiver 
to one satellite, you on the right-hand side um, is kind of a quiet time where you the the perturbations look similar to the mid-latitude perturbations. And if I remove the trend, I can get the gravity wave and the acoustic waves there on the lower two right-hand panels. And the magnitudes there are similar to the ones that we saw in the um, mid-latitude regions. But oftentimes you'll get this very wild tech trace, which is on the left-hand side, which I believe is associated with these plasma bubbles. And when you filter into the regimes of gravity wave and acoustic waves, you get, you get waves that are 10 times bigger than the mid-latitude regions. So I basically broke the, the analysis down into two different threshold regimes for this, which I think are looking at bubbles versus waves and how they behave in time. So again, on the top, we have thunderstorm activity broke, broken into high and low thunderstorm activity days in blue, and then red is the low thunderstorm activity days. And we have gravity wave activity on the middle panel and acoustic wave activity on the bottom panel. And there's a strong diurnal response with the gravity waves and the acoustic waves that um, is consistent with theories of seeding of gravity waves seed the instabilities in the ionosphere. And that's um, why it occurs at that particular um, time of day. And there is an increase with the higher thunderstorm activity days, so that was interesting to see. And then if we looked at the um, mid-amplitude regimes, which I think is more similar of the mid-latitude regime, uh, we also see an increase in the gravity wave coverage area and the acoustic wave co coverage area compared to when the thunderstorm activity increases. So I think there are two, um, two different regimes here that you can see in the low, low latitudes. And um, this is the first statistical study that was able to look at this specifically. And it does seem to um, uh, be consistent with a lot of the theories about what's going on in the ionosphere in this region. So um, basically, we found that uh, we can show that larger th thunderstorms correlate with larger ionospheric regions that are perturbed. <coughs> and the dominant mechanism of thunderstorm ionosphere interactions in low latitudes se seems to be through the seeding of instabilities and in creating plasma bu bubbles. But we are able to see acoustic wave and gravity wave direct responses on the ionosphere in the mid-latitudes and the low-latitudes region. So, um, and I think the study of ionosphere with GPS tech measurements, the future of the studies is extremely promising with um, increasing receiver density and possi possibly more high-rate data available. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Harry, for your presentation. We have time for a couple of questions. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so I was wondering if you see a difference in amplitude or if you would expect to see that in the, the signature of the mm -hmm. TPC perturbation just from the uh, severity of the thunderstorm. Yeah, I didn't have time to touch on that, but we do look at the amplitude variation and it you can notice a difference. The problem is, that, again, that we're not probing the entire region all the time. We only have measurements in certain locations. So we're not always necessarily measuring the region of the peak amplitude perturbation. So you can't say for sure whether you measured the maximum amplitude perturbation. So I believe that the area is a little bit more of a, a more sensitive measurement, but you can see the signal in the, in the amplitude. Um, so to measure the thunderstorm size, um, in the mid-latitude study, we had a, or we used radar data um, from uh, weather radars, and I um, had a contour level that's based on the reflectivity that can give you an indication of the severity of the thunderstorm. And then in the low-latitude regions, I used the Worldwide Lightning Location Network data, which provides global lightning data. and um, We've used that as a good proxy of thunderstorm activity in the past. 